Hello world, this is Lisa Fredrickson, your friend and computer science professor, and this short screencast is going to talk about Pacific Trails Chapter 8 and make sure that you're up to speed with your files so that you can finish Chapters 9 and 10 strong and finish the class strong. There are just so many important details and concepts in Chapter 8 that I thought this was worthy to do. So the overall goal of Chapter 8 is to make sure your web page looks good at three basic screen sizes. And those three basic screen sizes are a laptop or a desktop size screen, a medium size screen, which simulates what it would look like on a tablet, and then also a small screen size, which simulates what it would look like on a iPhone. So the big changes that we're going to make are we're going to change our style sheet so that the styles for the phone sized width are actually at the top of the style sheet. This is called a mobile first style sheet. And then as the screen gets larger, we're going to query for the width of the screen. And when the width of the screen gets beyond 600 pixels, that's the minimum width, we're going to apply some new styles. And the new styles that are applied at this tablet size screen query are we're going to change the orientation of the nav to horizontal, whereas in the smallest screen size, it's in a vertical orientation. And we're also going to change the content in the yurts and activities pages in these sections. We're going to change it when we get to tablet size screen. We're going to make that into a three column display for that content on the yurts and activities pages. At the large screen size, when we get to above 1024 pixels, we're going to take that nav and put it in its own column on the left. We're also going to constrict the overall wrapper to 80% of the width of the screen and center it inside the viewport. So those are the basic changes that we're going to make to the style sheet. Now, when we get into the textbook instructions, if you look at figure 8.58, it's showing you how the small display wireframe elements, the medium display wireframe elements, and the large display wireframe elements are going to change. Small and medium look pretty much the same, but on the large screen, we see that we have the nav now in that first column. And so that's why it's been so important as we've been going through the instructions to get your wireframe tags set up correctly so that when you want to move large sections of the content on the page around into different arrangements, you've got the correct content identified. And that's what she's asking you to do in this second task. Make sure your wireframe elements on your web page are correct. And we've got one, two, three, four, five sections inside the wrapper. We can see that both from the diagram, one, two, three, four, five sections inside the wrapper, as well as in how the HTML is coded. So when we're coding our HTML, you know, I've been a big believer in indentation, and I want to see your wireframe elements, one, two, three, four, and five is the footer, indented at the same level inside that wrapper just make it enormously easier for you to see, to code correctly the first time, and to debug later if needed. Then we get into modifying the CSS, and she has you remove a lot of declarations, starting with anything that floats and anything that has a left margin. And so in my style sheet, this is the solution. Instead of removing those styles as she goes through those instructions, I've merely commented them out because the same thing only leaves that declaration in the style sheet should I want to go back and look at it. I highly encourage you to use this commenting out technique to temporarily hide code because sometimes it's so nice to see what you've done in the past. But you've probably already deleted these styles, but look through my styles sheet to make sure that all the styles that I have commented out, you've either commented out yourself or deleted in your style sheet. And I have my style sheet really well organized. First, I have my default body and outer wrapper styles. Then I have all my header styles. So it's really easy to find these styles for modification purposes and maintenance purposes. Then I have my nav styles. Again, we're removing the floats and the widths and the margin left and some other various styles because we're making this top set of styles the styles that are for a mobile or small screen size. As I go down, here are my nav styles, all of them. Here are my main and section styles. Again, I've commented out the large margin lefts, the entire area for the section style, 
the DT element is not used in the pages anymore, so I went ahead and commented that out. And then I've got all my headings, H1, H2, H3, and my footer, and finally my classes and my IDs. So you can stop this video at any point and make sure your style sheet for the top mobile styles matches what she has asked you to do in steps A, 1 through 8. When we get that top mobile style sheet modified by removing and tweaking these styles, then we're back to one column and she shows you a picture of how the index page looks as one column and one column alone. And the reason we want to start there is because we want the styles at the top of our style sheet to be for that mobile small screen display. It's just that right now we haven't added in any styles for tablet or large screen. So every size screen is going to look like this one column display that she shows in figure 8.60. Next, she shows you figures 8.61 and 8.62. These are the final solutions. This is how we want our yurts and our activities pages to look at small screen size, tablet size, and large screen size. And again, we can just look across there and see what the changes are. The changes to the nav occur at each breakpoint. At the medium display, we no longer want that vertical nav. We want it to be horizontal. And at large display, we're going to put it in its own column. And then the content on the yurts and activities pages at small screen nav size, we want that to be one column. But at tablet and large, we're going to change that so that there are three columns again. So how do we do that? Well, we go to task three, and she tells you that she wants your media query to be check for all screens that are at a minimum 600 pixels wide and do these styles. Here's what the style sheet looks like for that. So for our medium styles, we're going to query our minimum width of 600 pixels. And if our screen is 600 pixels or above, we're going to put in these styles. Make sure that all the styles for your medium sized display are inside these curly braces. And then we're going to change the nav to a flex box. We're going to make the flex direction be a row. We're not going to wrap the content and we're going to justify the space around it. And that's how we get this nifty nav with these items inside the nav to flex inside this flex box. You can see that the space between them changes depending upon the width of the screen. So the nav becomes now a flex box and we're flexing the content inside it. We're removing the bottom border on the list items. And then she has you add in some rules for the section, margin left, margin right, two M's, and this dot flow selector, which styles a class equals flow in the style sheet before she has you add it in the HTML. So that's a bit confusing, but what she's doing is creating a flex box for something in the HTML with a class equals flow. The direction of the flex box is row. And then what's inside the flex box are these three sections. So if we look at the yurts HTML, here's our class equals flow. Here's the div that we add, and here are the three section elements that then flex inside that box. And she has you do that to show you the difference between a flex box and how we got three columns in the previous chapters, which was by setting the width of these sections to something less than a third and then floating them left so that they all floated beside each other. So that's just another way to make three columns. You can do it either with a flex box, uh, outer container, or with float. Two techniques to accomplish the same thing. But for this chapter, we're setting that area to be a flex box instead of floating three columns. So that's the styles that you want in your medium style sheet. Then we go to task four, the large style sheet, where we're going to use a grid to create the two columns with the nav in the first column and the rest of the content in the second column. Our header is going to span both of those columns. She even wants you to use this at supports query to check for grid display. Make sure that your browser can display a grid. And so all of these instructions go in the last media query where we are querying for screens that are greater than 1,024 pixels. And here's how that looks in the style sheet. So here's our query. 
we're looking to apply these styles to any screen that is 1,024 pixels or greater. And remember always that the styles accumulate. So all of the top styles that apply to mobile also apply to tablet unless they're changed. And all of the top styles and tablet styles also apply to the large screen size unless they are modified because they are cumulative. So we're just merely adding in new styles or modifying existing styles. We don't have to put all the styles for each screen size in every section because they accumulate. Because after all, a screen that's greater than 1,024 pixels is automatically going to be greater than a screen for 600 pixels, and all the top styles are global anyway. So again, we're just adding in styles that either change or are added at each of these breakpoints. For our wrapper, we're going to put in some styles that we've already we're familiar with that we deleted out of the global style sheet because after all, we don't want to change the overall wrapper to be only 80% wide and have left and right automatic margins until we get to this large screen size. We're going to put the border back on and we're going to put a box shadow back on. We're going to, on the nav, we're going to now align that content left and put in a little bit of padding on the left side. Now here's the hard part. Here's where she has you use the at supports query to only apply the styles if that browser supports grid. And you want to be very careful with your indentation and your curly braces because each one of these selectors has declarations that are surrounded by curly braces. And then the entire at supports display grid query also has a set of curly braces. And then finally, the whole entire large screen media query has a set of curly braces. So you want to be real careful with that. And here are the things that she asks you to do. At step three on page 317, she asks you to use this query. So since these two declarations, which go with the nav UL selector, have nothing to do with grid, they can actually move out of this feature query where we're applying these rules if the browser supports grid. And let's just look at these two rules. It tells us that we're going to leave our UL in the nav in a flex box, but we're changing the direction. So up here at the tablet size, the flex direction was row, and we're changing that to column so that when we look at our web page, here our nav UL is in a row, and as we go to a full screen size, we want it to be in a column. And finally, we do these rules inside the at supports display grid feature query. So here is the hardest part to code, these grid areas. Now you need to go back to figure 8.63 in the book in order to make sense of those. And here's 8.63. And so we have one, two, three, four, five different grid areas, the header, nav, hero, main, and footer areas. And we're setting those up in the style sheet inside this feature query as such. So here are our five areas that we're naming of our grid. Now, this one is particularly odd because we don't have a class equals hero in our HTML yet to make sense of this. But we go ahead and code it in our CSS. We know we've got a header, nav, main, and footer elements. So those four make sense. This is the one that's a little bit weird because we have not yet coded class equals hero in our HTML. But later on, we go ahead and do that. We add the class equals hero to that div that contains the hero image on every one of our pages. So that's how that dot hero grid area connects with our HTML. Down here in the pound sign wrapper selector then, we are displaying that whole wrapper's grid here are our areas, and here's our template. And the template rule is indeed interesting. We have to look at figure 8.63 to see that the first row is all the header. The second row is the nav section and the hero section that we've just coded. The third row is the nav and the main section, and the fourth row is the nav and the footer. We don't have any values behind these names because we're not specifying a height for any of these rows. We're not putting in, you know, 30 pixels or any unit of measure behind the rows because that would specify heights. 
we're just going to allow the height of the content in these rows to determine the height of those rows. But at the end, after a slash, we're saying 180 pixels and one FR, one fractional unit, because we want that first column to be 180 pixels wide. And the reason we know that, it goes again back to this figure 8.63. They specify this first column be 180 pixels wide and the rest of it to be just the rest of the screen. So it's header header for the first row, nav hero for the second row, nav main for the third row, and nav footer for the fourth row. And that's what's connecting with this grid template. And then here are the widths of the columns. 180 pixels and then one fractional unit. We could have used any other unit of measure there, but that is what the book has specified. So there's our entire style sheet for chapter eight. Please update your files according to this. Save them, update them, update your chapter eight assignment link if you want me to double check this, but I want you to be good to go with a mobile first responsive web design style sheet that includes both of the flex boxes and the grid going into chapters nine and 10. Thank you.